Hey, all you cats and kittens out there, it's Mr. Lamine coming to you live from Big Cat Rescue. Just got done watching Tiger King on Netflix. If you didn't get that reference, what are you doing watching this video? Why are you not on Netflix watching Tiger King? It will blow your mind. It's insane. It's a little out there. I don't know if I can officially be recommending a TVMA for some of you in the audience, since many of you are like 14 or something, but um, <laughs> it's wild. Uh it's wild. Uh, just got done watching it with the actress who portrays my wife, but is quarantined here with me. Um, she is upstairs right now, uh, recovering from how awesome Tiger King was, but uh, I thought I would come down here and uh, go through lecture number three with you. Hope everything's going well. Hope everyone's staying safe, staying sane, um, finding something to, uh, some reason, some way to get out of the house, you know, walking the dogs. I still been going for my runs. I combined the two today when a German Shepherd bit me. Um, it didn't break the skin. I think I'm okay. Uh, we'll see if I start foaming at the mouth soon or not. But um, that is not why we're here. Got the tie on, meaning it is time to do a little bit of learning. Uh, things are, we're going to be entering the 1850s today. Uh, got a couple more lectures. We're going to split up the decade of the 1850s and mm, three, four lectures, uh, but <laughs> it gets wild. We're about to get violent. Um, today, we are actually going to have... Um, Horror of all horrors, the final action uh, by Henry Clay. Uh, he's going to save the day one last time and then die. But before we get into the content, a few announcements. First off, check your grades, please. Uh, we are into the fourth quarter. I have put fourth quarter grades in. Um, so make sure you go and check the third quarter. Make sure you go and check the fourth quarter. Um, if you see something that you're missing from the third quarter that you think is wrong, uh, let me know. If you see something from the fourth quarter, from the Arctic Academies, which is all the fourth quarter is at this point, um, that you think you've submitted, please, you don't have to email me and yell at me and say, hey, idiot, uh, I know I'm an idiot. Uh, my wife knows I'm an idiot. You can just email it again and Say, hey, I thought I turned this in before. Maybe it fell through the cracks. Here you go. Um, so make sure we're checking those grades. Call me out if I make any mistakes. Mm, you know, when we're at school and it's a normal everything, I'm normally pretty good about getting things graded, not making any mistakes. Here, I can't make any promises. I got stuff coming in me from three and four places. So, you know, just let me know if I've made a mistake. Um, please feel free to contact me. I am as new at this online only as you guys are. Uh, the only thing is I don't have all these other classes and all these other teachers. I just know what I'm doing. So if there's something that you find that you like uh, from another class uh, that you think I could try to incorporate, let me know. If you have comments, questions, concerns, suggestions, anything I can do to make this more streamlined, more straightforward, easier for you, less stressful for you, um, and you know maybe more educational, something that, so you can learn. I, I, it is important to me that you still learn something um, or um, make me feel like you're learning something. This is uh, what I really, really, really care about. Um, you know, let me know. I'm, I'm really open to stuff. You can just set, shoot me an email, shoot me a message on school as you say, hey, this is what, you know, my science teacher did. Maybe we can do something like that. Hey, you know, we, maybe, we, we, maybe we can try a live class where, where you guys conference and I don't know. You tell me what you want and I will try to get it done. Um, so just let me know. I don't want you guys to stress out too much. I want this to be as easy on you as possible. Um, I know a lot of you guys got a lot of other stuff, a lot of other concerns going on other than just this class. So um, I'm trying to be empathetic. Let me know if there's anything I can do to make it easier. Um, let's make sure we're getting our work turned in. Uh, the Arctic Academy is the fourth nine weeks. So um, you guys have a couple web quests, um, a discussion or two, uh, an activity sheet from the first two lectures. You should be starting a new one today. Um, and the Unit 5 Study Guide honors you will have the jackson essays i'm going to get those in this weekend um by monday by monday or so uh you should be able to see your grade there as well so um check those grades make sure you got everything in make sure i'm giving you the proper credit if you have a comment because you're missing something you know get that into me let me know that you got that in oh excuse me and i will get your grade squared away um there is a quiz upcoming um that is not quite published to everyone yet. I'm making the honors quiz right now. Um, but after today's class, um, the content will be on all of that. All of my quizzes have always been open notes, so it's still open notes. It is going to be on Schoology, through Schoology. Schoology should be able to grade it for me real quick, and you will be able to know what you get uh, in a very short amount of time. Uh, the Unit 6 Study Guide is not posted shortly. It is posted right now. I forgot to change that. 
Um, it's not due anytime soon uh, because after today, we're going to be like halfway through unit six. Um, but you can go ahead and start on it. You can go ahead and start on it. Um, I will be collecting it. That will be one of the larger grades. Uh, I'm just working on the assumption. I honestly have no information. I'm working on the assumption we're going to be in Arctic Academy for a while. I know the president has said he wants everything back to normal by Easter. I don't know if that's going to be the case. So I'm working on the assumption we're going to be here for a while. That study guide is going to be a big, important grade. All it is, 30 questions um, that are just like, hey, what is Manifest Destiny? What was this thing? Who is this dude? Um, and then four shorter answer questions that are mostly your opinion that you, by answering, I will be able to get a sense. Do you understand what's going on? Do you have a brain in your head? Are you using that brain? So you can go ahead and start on that stuff. Um, it's not due anytime soon, but you're not going to want, and I know you're all going to hear that and tune out and say, oh, okay, good. It's not due anytime soon. You're not going to want to sit down and say, oh crap, it's due tomorrow. Let me go answer these 34 questions all of a sudden. You're not going to want to do that. I know you don't. So I have it up there early. I'm Again, I'm trying to make this as low key low stress on you as possible. So you can start on it, right? I know most of you won't. Kennedy, you can go ahead and get started. Um, the rest of you, go ahead and wait till the last second. You're going to have a bad time. Um, also, last thing, please only work on assignments that have been assigned. A few of you have been fantastic go-getters and have opened up like the unit six folder and found files that I put in there and you've just gone ahead and done them. Um, one, you know, I don't know that I'm going to assign everything. Sometimes I just throw things in those folders that I might use, might not use. So you're kind of taking a gamble there. Um, and I think I'm assigning enough work for you. I don't want to assign more work. So make sure you're getting all the other work done and you're not just going into the folder and checking and saying, oh, hey, here's a file. Let me just do this. Go to the updates. Read the updates. I try to make it as simple as I can. I know I type more than I probably should, but I try to make it as uh, clear as possible. Only work on the assignments that are assigned when they're assigned. So right now, um, you know, recently you've had a couple discussions, you've had a web quest, you have today's video and activity sheet. Um, work on that in the future. If you see other stuff in there, work on that stuff as well. After today, you will have some questions on Uncle Tom's Cabin. So there's a short, short reading and a few more questions. Um, so after this, go into the unit six folder, find those, but don't work on anything else. All right. All right. Real quick, and this review is super important because everything we're going to do from now on really builds off of each other. Everything that we've done is building in general. This stuff is going to build very specifically today off of what we talked about last class. So what did we talk about last time? Well, we elected James K. Polk, our 11th president, by a whisker, of which I have many on my very trashy looking face right now. Um, he defeated Clay barely thanks to a third party in New York, but it's enough. He runs on that platform of Manifest Destiny saying, we're going to take California um, or buy California or steal California or whatever. We're going to get California. We're going to settle Oregon. It's going to be ours. We are going to fulfill our destiny of going from coast to coast. To do this, he picks a fight. Um, our first war of expansion with Mexico, the Mexican-American War in 1846 to 1848. Big wins on the battlefield. Um, not a lot of casualties on the battlefield. 13,000 plus overall, though, pretty high. Um, and it causes a lot more sectionalism. Uh, the biggest indicator of this is the Wilmot Proviso, uh, which David Wilmot says, hey, South, you say this isn't about slavery and its expansion. Prove it. No, it, no slavery in ter any territories that we get from Mexico. Of course, uh, the in the Senate where power was balanced at the time, uh, the South says, no way, no way. Um, and of course, this whole thing is going to divide the North, divide the South. They are at each other's throats, even though it's only 1847, 1848, going into 1849. This, they're at each other's throats, uh, very wary of each other, very paranoid of each other. Um, South thinks slavery is in danger, that the North is trying to kill it, uh, and that slavery must expand for it to survive. The North is afraid that the South is not playing fair, um, going to use their undue influence and power to spread slavery maybe everywhere. Last thing, and this is going to go right into what we're talking about. We do peacefully settle Oregon and the, the issue there with Britain splitting it at the 49th parallel. And most importantly, the gold rush takes off in California outside. Most of you guys got Sutter's Mill. Um, uh, the gold rush starts there in 1848 with thousands of people from Asia, the first Asians to come to, to the United States um, from Latin America, from South America, um, from Europe, and of course, thousands from the United States make their way to California. 
many of them in 1849, which is why they are known as the 49ers. And this is going to rapidly expand the population of California, which leads us into our first slide and very first bit of content, right? Things do get wild. Um, no less with uh, old Henry Clay here, and his balancing act. I do not know how he is balancing himself on those scales. Don't ask. But the compromise of 1850, right? It's a compromise. Meaning we got to be talking about my boy, Henry Clay. Um, so in 1847, California is not officially a part of the United States. By 1848, California is officially a part of the United States. But no Americans live there. By 1850, California is banging on the door of statehood. They're ready to skip the territorial phase entirely um, and just become a state. But both the North and the South kind of call dibs, right? A lot of these 49ers, some of these 49ers are Southerners who bring their slaves and say, hey, we should be able to allow, uh, we should be allowed to have our slaves. We should be able to allow to bring more slaves in. California, as some people can tell you, Amaru, right? Great uh, land for agriculture. So some Southerners are seeing California as a possible, um, haven for slaves. Others uh, are saying, no way. Um, we want it from Mexico. You said South, this wasn't about expanding slavery. A lot of people in California don't want it to be a slave state, right? Think about if you're a 49er and you go to California and you've risked everything to try to find gold. And next to you is a guy from Georgia and he's sitting there in his lawn chair watching his, you know, 10, 12, 13 slaves look for gold. You're not going to like that very much. And so a lot of the people in California say, no, we don't want this to be a slave state. But this is going to devolve into the ugliest sectional battle yet. You have the North and the South both fully dug in. Uh, they are not in a good mood. And only your boy, oh, Henry Clay, in one of his final acts. Dude's almost dead. He's dying from tuberculosis. He is on the way out. Um, but he is going to muster what strength he has left to try to uh, negotiate a final compromise. It is going to happen in 1850, which is why, as clever historians have named it, the Compromise of 1850. So here is the map of the United States at this time, right? This big area here we call the Mexican Session with a C because they ceded it to us, right? We have this huge Oregon territory we got cut off at the 49th parallel. All of this is unorganized still for now. Um, we'll get back to you on that here in a lecture or two. But this whole area, right, most of it is vacant. Now, some of it is excellent, excellent land. Utah, right, Kennedy? But California is where most people live, right? They're skipping over New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada. They're skipping over that, and they're going to California to try to find gold. They want to be a, a state, preferably a free state, but the South has kind of said over our dead body. Now, first thing for you guys, on your activity sheet. Many of you guys did an excellent job of this, so you can go ahead and pause the video here um, and answer these questions on your brand new act activity sheet. Um, things are worse than they've ever been. Tension is high. It's rising higher by the day. Um, first, give me a quick, brief little summary. How do we get to this point, right? What are some of the reasons the North and the South are at each other's throat? Um, and don't just say slavery, right? Be a little bit more specific. What specific complaints does the North have, the South have, right? Where you know, give me a brief, a brief timeline, uh, trace me an outline of why are we now in 1850, right? 1816, 1824, allegedly we're in the air of good feelings. 26 years later, we're ready to murder each other if it weren't for Henry Clay. How did we get to that point? Last part here, how are we going to get out of this mess? Is there a way forward, right? Henry Clay's dying. Is there a way forward that doesn't lead to secession and or civil war, right? Um, essentially is is all of this, everything that's happening, right, uh, is it inevitable? Is it inevitable? I don't know. You tell me. Go ahead, pause, answer that. I'll see you on the next slide. All right. So let's actually make a compromise. Uh, Henry Clay is what he does best. Right? He might get a bad rap because he's compromising with slavery, with slave owners. But again, what is his goal every time? Yeah, that's right. Good job, Amaru. It is peaceful union, right? Peaceful union. Union. How are we going to stay together peacefully? Comes up with a very complicated compromise, but one that everyone thinks is his most brilliant uh, ever at that time. It's five parts. Very simple. First part, California. It wants to be a free state. It's going to be a free state, right? Remember back to his first compromise, Missouri compromise. Missouri wanted to be a slave state. 
They got to be a slave state. He's going to stick to that. He's going to say, hey, we're not going to force California to be something it doesn't want to be. Uh, if you extend the, let's go back, if you extend the Missouri Compromise Line, right? Some people said at the time, let's do that. Well, if you trace it out, boop, it cuts California in half. California didn't want to be two states, wanted to be one state. So they said, no way, uh, just let us be a free state. Bam, there you go. Uh, we're going to skip over the second part for a second. Uh, but these, and that's something the North gets, right? California is a free state. What's something that the South gets? Well, they get something called the Fugitive Slave Act. Now, some of you might remember that we talked about this briefly when we did the Constitution. Uh, a fugitive slave is a runaway slave, right? A slave who has, uh, in some ways, kidnapped and been kidnapped uh, as, it, as the thief and the property that's been stolen and is run away. Has run away. A fugitive slave is a runaway slave, someone who has made an attempt to gain their freedom illegally, right? It's not technical freedom, right? It's just freedom uh, to live like a free person in a free territory. So you have, right, if you're living in Missouri, right, maybe you run away to Illinois, maybe you run away to Iowa, maybe you run away into what's going to be Kansas or Nebraska. If you live in uh, Virginia, D.C., maybe you're running away to Pennsylvania. Right? If you live in Maryland, maybe you're going to Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Um, a lot of these people are taking the Underground Railroad and are trying to go somewhere in the north. Uh, normally, the further the north, the better uh, to get away from slave catchers. And if not, all the way to Canada. Um, now, in the Constitution, it says that northern states are required to help return these fugitive slaves. But they haven't really been doing this. The North has, a lot of these Northern st states have really said, look, um, we are not, as a state, going to send like state troopers out to find runaways, arrest them, and return them. Okay? If you are a Southern slaveholder and you think one of your slaves is living in Pennsylvania, you can come here and, or you can hire a slave catcher, right? Like a bounty hunter. You can hire dog, right, Maddie? You can hire Dog the Bounty Hunter, and they can go to uh, Pennsylvania and track them down. But Pennsylvania is not going to spend resources to kidnap these people, essentially, or to re-enslave them. And this infuriates the South because they're pointing to the Constitution, right? They're, they're, they're going to say, hey, the Northern abolitionists, you're always hiding behind the Constitution with your petitions, with your freedom of speech, with your freedom of the press. But where are you when it comes to the Fugitive Slave Clause? Hmm? Where are you? You're nowhere to be found. So the South has been furious that the North is allowing fugitive slaves um, and it's not thousands and thousands, right? It's negligible. But if you're an individual slave owner, that's a very valuable slave. And it's, for some of these people, the principle. For your John C. Calhouns, it is the principle. You agree to the Constitution. You rub that in our face all the time. You got to hold your end of the bargain. And so the Fugitive Slave Act uh, requires not that just states help return fugitive slaves, but that every citizen of the United States um, is now legally required to help return, to help capture, to help identify runaway slaves. So it is now on you legally. You can end up in trouble with the law. You can end up fined. You can end up in prison if you are harboring a fugitive, if you are not helping uh, aiding and capturing and returning a fugitive. This turns every single person in the North, by law, into a slave catcher, right? Before, maybe you don't care about slavery too much. Now, you gotta have to make a decision if you're in the North. Plus, what's even more messed up, the most messed up thing about this, in my opinion, is they try to give the Fugitive Slave Act a veneer of legality by saying, we're not going to just kidnap people with uh, darker skin and bring them back to the South. We're going to put them on trial um, and determine legally, are they a runaway or not? But these people aren't allowed to testify for themselves. Um, any person of African heritage, free or not, is not allowed to testify in court. Um, so really, it is just a slave catcher going, that's a slave, uh, or it's a slave master saying, yep, that's my slave. And the judge, right, the judges in this case, they get money depending on how they rule. They get $5 if they say, no, this person you brought before me is not a runaway slave. They are legally uh, a free person. Let them go. Five bucks, right? Which was okay money at the time, right? Uh, 
They get $10, though, twice the amount of money if they go, nope, this person is a runaway slave. Sorry, you have to go back to the South, right? So if you are a less than upstanding judge, what do you think they're going to say, right? The person who's accused of being a runaway can't testify. His wife, his mother, the neighbor that he's lived by for 20 years can't testify. It's just a slave owner or slave catcher going, that is a slave. That is my property. And the judge going, 10 bucks to me. Yep. Get him out of here. So very few people are going to be found to be free under the uh, Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, now, that's a big, big win for the South, right? So the North got their big win in the, with California. The South gets their big win with the Fugitive Slave Act. Now, the slave trade, right? The selling of slaves, the buying and selling of slaves is made illegal in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Now, this is a big win for abolitionists. Um, it's a partial win. They've been pushing for the outright abolition of slavery in Washington, D.C., a place that um, you know, not everyone's sure that Congress can actually outlaw slavery everywhere. Like They know that Pennsylvania can outlaw it in Pennsylvania, but they're not sure that Congress could theoretically say, hey, no slavery anywhere, but they know Congress has the authority over D.C. because remember, it's not a state. Uh, Congress is in charge of Washington, D.C. So they've been pushing for a while, hey, Congress, get rid of slavery here um, but they went a baby step in the, the slave trade. So if you are um, looking to buy or sell a person, you can't do that in D.C. You have to go really super close by across the river into Maryland or, or Virginia. It's more of a symbolic win, but it is a win nonetheless. Uh, the last or the fourth part here, excuse me, is the Texas border right here. Look at how weird Texas looks um, with this like Bart Simpson head and this weird snorkel panhandle thing. Um, it's been claiming all of this. New Mexico, right next door, has been saying, nah, nah, son, that ain't you. Um, you're taking some of our territory. Texas is legitimately ready to go to war with New Mexico over this, and but owes a bunch of money in debt due to their war for independence. Henry Clay says, how about this? You look like a normal Texas, right? the Texas we know and love, um, and we'll pay your debt for you, Texas. And they go, oh, sounds good, partner. Um, and so we get that settled peacefully. Last part, and this is a new one, this is a doozy, this is going to be a re recurring theme, all right? And it's a little ambiguous as to who wins here, right? Free state, that definitely went for the North. Slave trade, win for the North. Fugitive Slave Act, win for the South. Texas, uh, not being massively in debt, not going to war, win for the South. New Mexico and Utah, right? The greatest territory, Kennedy. Um, new Mexico and Utah, they are going to be settled in a new and creative way, very American way. Uh, it is, with a fancy term, popular sovereignty. Now, all that means is that instead of Congress saying slave or free, they are going to, in the future, put it to a vote, and they're going to let the people of that territory decide for themselves. Do they want to be a slave territory? Do they want to be a free territory? Right? Very democratic and very American. Hey, why should a senator from Massachusetts, why should a representative from Florida, why should they tell the people of New Mexico, why should they tell the people of Utah what they're going to do, what they're going to allow? Let's just let them do it. And this is going to be spun by a uh, new character that we're going to talk about more later on, a guy named Stephen A. Douglas. He is going to push this. This is going to be his his baby. Um, and he's going to say, hey, we don't have to fight about this anymore. We're just going to let the people decide, right? And we'll just go with whatever they decide. We won't have to fight. North and South can get along. When this passes, uh, it looks on paper like couple wins for the North, couple wins for the South, one win here for both. Maybe, you know, maybe one goes one way, one goes the other. And if you're the North, you're going, hey, both of these are definitely going to be free. If you're the South, you're going, hey, both will definitely be slave. So you're probably feeling pretty good about that. Um, people are freaking out saying Henry Clay did it again. They think that all of our problems are over. Right? Oh, yeah. So we have our, uh, again, a couple moderate victories couple clear victories, um, one for the both sides, right? This is our new map where California is going to enter as a free territory. Utah and New Mexico are going to get to enter as whatever they want uh, due to popular sovereignty, 
right? Rest of our area here in the south that has been slave, still slave, everything else, right? All of this, remember, north of the Missouri Compromise Line, north of 3630, so this all gets to be free. All of these are free states. Good to go. Now, my question to you, looking at this, right, looking at these five things, right, this clear victory for the north, clear victory for the south, moderate for both, moderate for the north, moderate for the south. Who won? Who do you think got the better of the deal? Um, are there any issues? Are there any things you, you can think of that are maybe unresolved, things that this didn't talk about that maybe it should have, or areas that it didn't talk about that it, that it should have, or um, areas that it talked about, but maybe it wasn't clear enough? Um, or could cause problems. And what other new issues could arise, right? Anything um, that uh, maybe they thought they had settled or things from terms of this that are going to pop up and that we haven't talked about before, but all of a sudden are going to become very important. So who won? What issues are left unresolved? What new issues? Any ideas that you have on a new issue going forward? Go ahead and pause this thing, and I'll see you on the other side. All right, let's talk about the reaction. Um, because at first, honestly, at first, everyone in America was so relieved. Most people, a lot of people, and I've read a lot because, again, I love Henry Clay. It's for it's for real, for real. If I have a kid, uh, he will be named Henry Clay. But people are going into this thinking there's no way out. We're probably going to have secession. We're probably going to have war, right? We're going to tear ourselves apart. And when Henry Clay and Stephen A. Douglas and um, John C. Calhoun, who we didn't even talk about in this, thankfully, um, when they all sit down, and John C. Calhoun never agrees to this. Um, sorry, Graham. But um, when the North and the South, enough senators, enough congressmen, when the president, when they all sit down and agree to uh, this compromise, Americans are wildly exuberant. They exhale and they go, okay, good. It's solved. It's solved, right? You look at the map, it's all taken care of, right? Everything's taken care of. Everyone, we know what everyone's going to be. There, unless we have another war of expansion and take over Canada or take over more of Mexico, which we're probably not going to do, um, we know we're going to have, right? There's going to be votes at some point in Utah and New Mexico. They'll pick for themselves. We are done. Right? We're done fighting. We've been fighting about this since 1819, 1820 with Missouri. <sighs> We're done. But then when the terms come out, um, both sides feel like they lost, which is not exactly what you want in a compromise. Right? Normally, like with the Missouri Compromise, uh, with the Tariff Compromise, you want people going, well, you know, I don't love the part that they got, but I'm pretty happy with what I got. And this, they both feel like they lost. Um they're, they, they're, they're both very upset. The South is furious over California, understandably, uh, over California, losing it, and the D.C. slave trade ban. They see this as a baby step, like it is. But they see it as a baby step to abolishing slavery in D.C., abolishing slavery everywhere, abolishing slavery in territories, right? The South is very expansionist. They keep talking. They're obsessed with taking, like, Cuba, um, and Puerto Rico, they they who they have grand ambitions. Uh, their a southern version of Manifest Destiny is not quite fulfilled. Um, so they're worried that the next time we go to war, the next time we get territory, um, it won't become slave, right? It just didn't, right? New Mexico, Utah, no guarantee, no guarantee that those two places become slave. And California is a free state. So they could be 0 for 3 in their minds, at least. They're probably 0 for 3. Um, so they're very furious about all of this. Uh, the North is um, pretty upset with New Mexico and Utah being opened, right? This whole idea of popular sovereignty instead of placating everyone, like Stephen A. Douglas thinks it will, upsets everyone, um, because now their, their solace is, well, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, um, probably not great areas for slavery. Um, so we should win the vote, but still on principle to open that up, that's a bunch of bull in their opinion. And they are furious over the Fugitive Slave Act. People who used to not give a crap at all about slavery, people who used to think abolitionists were nuts, um, cared way too much. Um, because remember, a lot of most all people in the North are still what we would consider very racist, white supremacists. Um, but they don't necessarily think slavery is a good idea. And now their hands are bloodied by this. Now they're looking. Well, wait a minute. I'm 
I'm a fugitive slave act officer. Like I have to rat people out, turn people in, help capture them. Like I'm a cop or something. No, 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 no. It was one thing for a lot of these people in the North when they didn't have anything to do with it, when they just lived in New England, when they just lived in Wisconsin um, and they never saw or came across a slave. Now it's pretty real, at least legally speaking, it's pretty real. Um, so they're pretty upset. Um, both sides are now digging in. Um, both sides are vowing, we're not giving in anymore, right? This is it. Uh, if you feel like you lost the compromise, then why would you compromise in the future, right? You're going to say, um, you know, if I'm just going to give everything away, why not stand and fight? Why give in and compromise? So um, it's very very difficult. It's going to be very difficult to um, compromise in the future, especially because Henry Clay is dead. Henry Clay uh, dies in 1852 of tuberculosis. Um, he, This is pretty much his last act. After he's done, he has to uh, step down. He goes uh, to seaside resorts, essentially, for a while to try to recover his health, but um, the tuberculosis is destroying his ability to breathe, um, and he is going to be unable to uh, be a major player after this ever again. So uh, it's going to be even harder to compromise without the great compromiser, right? Without the guy who comes in and says, look, I don't love slavery, but I love union and, and peace more. Let's make a deal. Those guys are gone, right? So no one's in a mood to compromise and no one has the gravity of a Henry Clay with the mindset of a Henry Clay to say, let's compromise. Let's make a deal, right? Let's make a deal. That's what Henry Clay was. He was a deal maker. He's now dead, unfortunately, RIP. Um, but that's going to make it very, very difficult um, to compromise, to forestall the Civil War. This does push it off by 10 years. Um, it saves the day, really, in a lot of ways for the North because they would not have been able to win a war probably in 1850. But now the South is just straight up determined we are going to expand slavery. It's the only way we're going to be able to keep our power in the Senate. It's our only way we're going to be able to keep up any kind of power in the House. Um, remember, House plus Senate equals the Electoral College. The South does not want to see the power to elect the president go away. Almost all presidents to this point, and we didn't talk about... Oh, shoot. We didn't talk about number 12, number 13, number 14, number 15. Uh, really, 15, James Buchanan, we'll, we'll mention, but we're not really talking about um, Millard Fillmore, who, you know, we should, Zachary Taylor drinks a bunch of milk on July 4th, gets a tummy ache and dies, um, and then Millard Fillmore becomes a president. We're not going to get into it, um, but uh, the South is now determined we must expand slavery, because if it doesn't expand, it will die, and our political power will go away. We won't have the senators. We won't have the House. We won't be able to elect presidents like we have pretty much 1 through 15, or will be 1 through 15. We have to expand slavery. Uh, the North, though, is is seeing this plan is going, okay, we have to stop them from expanding it. Um, when are, when When's enough going to be enough for the South, right? When is slavery going to go away? We thought it was going to go away back in the 1770s, 1780s. It ain't going away. What are we going to do about it? So it's going to become very difficult um, to do anything other than to start killing people, which is what is going to happen uh, very shortly. Not quite yet. Um, but this, right, some um, scenes of the fugitive slave law, right? And, and these you know, are more or less realistic scenes, people being dragged out of their house. Sometimes people who'd lived in the North for years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, right? Here you have a little girl. Right, tugging at the slave catcher, uh, the wife in the background, freaking out. You saw things in newspapers all over the North, right? Like slave hunters are not, uh, among us, attention colored people of Boston. Um, there are police officers out to get you. You're going to be kidnapped. Um, and not all the time were these people um, actual runaway slaves. Some of them were, and we're just trying to live a life of freedom. Some of them, like the uh, book that became the movie, 12 Years a Slave, that's based on a real story of a guy who was just kidnapped, born into freedom, kidnapped, became a slave for 12 years. Um, pretty messed up, right? You can see, uh, probably understand why so many people in the North are furious with it. Now, while all this is going on, right, while the North and the South are at each other's throats, while Henry Clay and Stephen A. Douglas are trying to work out a compromise and um, a dying John C. Calhoun is literally so weak 
that he just sits there glaring at uh, Congress while his speech is read for him. Because right? he's too weak to even give his own speech at this point because uh, he is on death's door. While that's going on, the South is having a convention, again, a fancy word for a meeting, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, in the Upper South, um, and it's a convention of Southern states. It's just slaveholding states, uh, invite only, sorry, Ohio, uh, you're not allowed to come on down. Uh, it, this is for the South only. They're meeting during the debates during 1850, and the whole purpose here is to discuss Southern unity and reaction to the compromise terms, right? How can we keep the South together? And how are we going to, as a region, react to the compromise that comes out and as it comes out, right? What are we going to do? We're we going to secede. We're we going to nullify some of this stuff. Are we going to protest? Um, what are we going to do? Right. Um, they're learning from the past. Right. If you guys remember back to the nullification debates during uh, or the nullification crisis during Andrew Jackson's presidency, South Carolina realized that they were really in trouble when no other southern state backed them up. When rest of the South watched on and kind of said, hey, yeah, go for it, South Carolina. We're rooting you on, but didn't want to get dragged in to the foray. Now the South is saying, okay, um, South Carolina might be crazy. They might be a little crazier than the rest of us, and they still are. But they're realizing, okay, our interests are the same, right? Protecting slavery, expanding slavery. How are we going to, as a region now, react? They decide that the time's not right to secede. After the compromise terms come out, right after these terms come out, they decide, okay, uh, we don't love it, but we got enough. We got enough. We got our Fugitive Slave Act that we wanted. We'll see how the North reacts to it. Right? It's not going to go well. It's going to infuriate the South, but it's not. Um, let's not secede yet. A lot of the South is not ready for that, but we need to act together. Now, what is important about this is that the South is now starting to act in concert together as a region. Right? It is not just South Carolina doing its own thing and Georgia doing its own thing and uh, Kentucky and Tennessee doing its own thing. And maybe those things jive and maybe they don't. Um, maybe South Carolina's way ahead and Georgia's uh, bringing up the rear. But now it is the South acting as a region, as a block, uh, together as a pseudo country. Right? What would a southern country look like? This is where they're going to start to figure that out. Last thing for today, it's a doozy. It's a book. It's a book. Um, one of the most famous books in all, of all time. Very difficult to read uh, because the author, a uh, little lady named Harriet Beecher Stowe, an abolitionist from New England, um, she tries to write it, as you guys will see in a sh very short excerpt I'm going to have you guys read. Um, she tries to write it the way that she uh, imagined slaves talked and spelled everything that way, so it it's difficult. It can be difficult to read and, until you start to figure it out, um, but it's a crazy important book. The way that Common Sense was a super important pamphlet to uh, the American Revolution, that is what Uncle Tom's Cabin is to the Civil War. So it's written by, as I said, a an abolitionist, a little lady named Harry Beecher Stowe. In fact, the story always goes, it's not true, uh, it's apocryphal, but the story always goes that she met Lincoln during the Civil War in like 1862, and he said to her, oh, so you're the little lady who started this big war, uh, which uh, you know, didn't really happen, I don't think, but um, tells you the importance of this story. So it is very simple. It is a book that chronicles, it's, it's fiction, it's made up, it's a novel, but it chronicles the life of slaves in the South. You have uh, Uncle Tom, you have uh, this slave named Lucy, you have um, old slaves, young slaves, children, and it, it follows their life. And um, the physical abuse, the violence, uh, then uh, there's an escape attempt across the frozen Ohio River with dogs in the background, right? Here we go. Um, you have uh, the kind old Uncle Tom uh, getting whipped by his terrible master, uh, It, but it is just a story uh, made up by uh, Harry Beecher Stowe to show you, you know, and uh, really humanize these slaves for people in the North. It is hugely influential. It sells more 
books in the 1800s in the 19th century than any other book other than the Bible. Everyone in the North knows this book, reads this book, hears this book, discusses this book, and it turns thousands of people in the North anti-slavery. You got to remember that when a book like this comes out, right, we're talking in the 1850s now, right, 1852, um, when this book comes out, slavery has been gone in a lot of these northern states for decades. Uh, slavery never existed in some of these northern states. If you live in Wisconsin, if you live in Michigan, uh, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, slavery was never allowed in your state. And depending on you know, what you do, which you're probably a farmer or a small businessman working in a, in a small town, you've never encountered slavery. You've never gone to the South. You've never witnessed a slave beating. You've never witnessed an auction. You've never seen a family torn apart by uh, a slave uh, or by, 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 some, by a master selling, you know, a child from a mother. Um, you've never come across it. You've never heard stories. And even if you live in a bigger city like Boston where uh, there are groups um, of uh, African Americans, of runaway slaves – Right? These cities are extremely segregated, and uh, even jobs are segregated, and, and a lot of times you're not going to come across to someone of a different race, let alone you know, sit down and have a conversation. Right? These people are still you know, mostly pretty racist, white supremacist. Right? It's not like uh, the North is modern, multicultural, integrated society. It's not like that. So a lot of these people in the North have never really seen slavery. They've never really thought about it. Um, what little thought they have, a lot of people are very sympathetic to a slave owner. It's been around forever. Um, it's in the Bible. They buy a lot of the, you know, property rights. Um, you know, so many of our presidents. It was just so normal, right? Slavery was just so normal in America in the 1850s. And even if you have, even if you haven't seen a slave or met a slave, it's just, it's just is just there. Like you just don't worry about it. And then you get confronted with it. And, you know, Harry Beecher Stowe is not a former slave owner or anything herself. She is fictionalizing this account, but it's a real enough account to these Northerners that it horrifies them. It shocks them. Uh, they read it and they, they come to see the slaves as people in a way that a lot of people in the South, um, you know, don't see their slaves. You can't see them as people. You have to see them as property, right? You have to see them as objects. It's really hard to treat another human this way, right? I was just watching, right, Graham. I was just watching a documentary series, or I am watching documentary series on Vietnam, and one of the former soldiers, you know, says he killed one one human in Vietnam, and after that, he had to uh, turn him into objects, or, you know, would have tore his soul apart, and that's how it was for a lot of these people in the South. They had to turn slaves into objects, um, but the Northern readers are seeing them as humans, right? This book humanizes slavery, and they might be white supremacists. They might be racist, but when they read the book, it's very clear that the white slave owners and the overseers are the bad guys. And you might think yourself superior due to your skin color, but it's pretty hard to see people like Uncle Tom as a bad guy in this story. So thousands in the North become anti-slavery, um, and you couple that with things like the Fugitive Slave Act, and with that being thrown into your face, and now Uncle Tom's Cabin is coming a couple of years later, and now all of a sudden, positions that were fringe uh, that most people in the North didn't take, like William Lloyd Garrison um, and these abolitionists. Now a lot more people are starting to go, wait a minute, maybe slavery is wrong, right? One, it's putting me in a weird position as having to be a slave catcher, possibly, um, with legal ramifications if I don't, but you know, if I think about it, you know, I might be a racist, but maybe slavery is wrong. Um, maybe it shouldn't be expanding. Maybe we shouldn't get rid of it, right? A lot of people are going to say, um, you know, I don't know what you do with them if you get rid of slavery. I don't know what you do with these people. I don't necessarily want them coming north, right? If you're a worker in a city in the north, you don't want them coming north and taking your job working for less. But um, 
people in the North are going to at least start thinking, maybe slavery is not great. Maybe if nothing else, it shouldn't expand. Right? Maybe at least it shouldn't expand. Now, this is going to be enough to infuriate, to enrage the South. They are going to call Harry Beecher Stowe all types of names. Uh, they are going to outlaw uh, her book. Um, in the South, right? It's not something you can go and buy in a Southern bookstore. Um, but uh, they are going to say it's all lies. It's made up. Um, it doesn't depict real slavery. Real slavery is much kinder, gentler. Um, slave owners really see themselves as protecting their slaves, as being in a family with these slaves, uh, paternalistic, right? They are the fathers of their uh, family, and their family includes their slaves. And yeah, it might be harsh and brutal at times, but they protect these people um, from cradle to the grave, uh, through sickness and health. And, um, you know, it's all justified. It's in the Bible. Uh, if God didn't want them to be slaves, they wouldn't be their slaves. Um, and so they are going to call this a slander, on the South, they are going to call this, um, you know, extra constitutional, unconstitutional uh, attacks, uh, things that are just, you know, out and out lies about slavery. And then when they see the reaction to these supposed lies about slavery in the North, when they see that thousands in the North are becoming anti slavery, anti expansion of slavery, um, when they see how dangerous this book is, um, that's going to infuriate them further because, you know, the South has a long history here with literacy and its dangers. Now, this is literacy that they can't do anything about, right? They can try to not educate the Nat Turners, the Denmark Vessies. There's nothing they can do about, you know, white folks in the North. Um, so the South is going to become very, um, I mean, they're already paranoid. They're already on edge. This is going to just continue to ramp that up higher and higher. Um, until uh, really they just decide that they are a different people from those in the North. They're a different culture. They have a different outlook. Uh, they have different ways of living. And um, their society is better. And maybe it should be separate. Maybe it should be separate. So um, last part here. Um, what makes a book, a movie, a video... Uh, anything, a piece of media so convincing that it can change the minds of thousands of people. What do you think it is about something like Uncle Tom's Cabin um, or any book, any movie, anything you've seen that changes people's minds, right? Because you guys have probably known you, you can sit and debate with someone all day, but that doesn't always change someone's mind. What does, okay? Uh, have you ever changed your thinking? Right now, um, I put specifically due to a book. I know a lot of you are very foreign to what a book is. So if you want to change that to like a movie, um, that's fine. You know, YouTube video. Um, how did anything, anything you've seen um, has it changed your mind? Last one here. Uh, the North loved Uncle Tom's Cabin. The South considered it propaganda. Right? Propaganda. They outlawed it. What's the difference between something being informative and something being propaganda? And if you don't know what that is, Google that word real quick. Um, what's the difference between something like a book, like Uncle Tom's Cabin, being informative, right? What's uh, between informative and propaganda? Can something be both? All right. Wrap up activity. It's the same for both of you uh, on level and honors children. Um, you're going to go to the Unit 6 slash Arctic Day folder on Schoology. Inside, you will need two things. One is a PDF. It is the Uncle Tom's Cabin reading excerpt. Um, read it. It's short. It starts with a little summary, and then it has a very short scene. It's a four-page PDF. You only need to read page, like, one to two. Stop where it says chapter 45. It's a really long block of text after that. You can ignore all that. Um, then there is also a Word document called uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin Questions. I believe there's ten of them. Um, answer those um, and get them in. Uh, you should have done the three questions from today, don't turn that in. Only turn in the Uncle Tom's reading excerpt questions uh, when you have those done. Obviously, you have a little bit of time. I don't have to have them right this second, but um, we have done a number of assignments. If you're getting behind, don't freak out, right? I take late work. As always, you get you do the work, you get the grade. 
make sure you are doing work. Make sure you're checking your grades. Make sure you're checking the updates every other day, right? Every odd day, if you're an odd day kid, every even day, if you're an even day kid, um, don't fall too far behind. If you're feeling overwhelmed, do some of the work, get me some of it. I'll get you partial credit, whatever. Um, but you know, don't let yourself to fall too far behind. I know I want to sit around. Uh, my Xbox is right there. I would like to turn it on and play, but, um, we gotta force ourselves, gotta have a little discipline, uh, gotta be a little tough-minded uh, and get stuff done. So, um, thank you all for coming to my TED Talk. Um, until next time, I will see you guys around. Make sure you are staying safe and stay inside. All right? Until next time. See ya.